that the defendant, Willard Noble Chaden Miller, should be sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 35 years. That's 17-year-old Willard Miller being sentenced to life in prison for the murder of his Spanish teacher, Noema Graber, who he killed because of a bad grade. We highlight the victim impact statements and talk to the prosecutor who helped put him behind bars. I'm Anjanette Levy. Welcome to Law & Crime's Sidebar Podcast. Willard Miller is a teenager from Iowa, and he is beginning this week serving a life sentence in prison for murder. So many of the cases we cover are senseless, and this one is even more so. A high school Spanish teacher, 66-year-old Noema Graber, was likely nearing retirement when Miller and his friend beat her to death over a bad grade. Miller was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after he serves 35 years. That doesn't mean he'll be released at that time. He'll simply be given a chance to appear in front of the parole board to see if he's fit to reenter society. Noema Graber was a Spanish teacher at Fairfield High School in Fairfield, Iowa. Willard Miller was one of her students. After Miller received a bad grade from Graber, he and his friend Jeremy Goodale plotted to kill her. According to the state's account of events, Noema Graber drove to a park in Fairfield after school to go on a walk. It was something she did often. On November 2nd, 2021, Miller and Goodale sneaked up on Graber and beat her to death with a baseball bat. Graber's body was found the next day under a tarp, a wheelbarrow, and a railroad tie, just hours after she was reported missing. Less than a day after her body was found, Miller and Goodale were arrested. Miller and Goodale were only minors at the time, but were charged as adults. Both have pleaded guilty to the crime. At Miller's sentencing hearing, Iowa Department of Criminal Investigation agent Trent Valletta walked the court through his investigation. Listen as he explains where he found the murder weapon. And during the search of uh, Miller's residence, was any item found that would be consistent with an item that could cause blunt force injury? Yes, there was a baseball bat located in the Miller residence. And this is that state's exhibit 104, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, where was this exactly in the Miller residence? It was in uh, Willard Miller's room behind the chair. Okay. So this obviously photo was taken with the chair removed, is that right? Yeah, no, correct, yes. And I... So, just to fast forward a bit, um, Jeremy Goodale was interviewed in this case, is that right? That's correct. Uh, his interview that would be consistent with the description of this bat as being used to uh, cause the death of Noyne Graber. Yes, he described the bat that was used as having like flames or something on that, as you can see in the photo, that would uh, coincide with what we're looking at the photo. This bat would have been submitted to the DCI Crime Laboratory for DNA analysis, is that right? That's correct. Uh, did anything uh, come back positive that would have identified it as being directly associated with the death of knowing a graver? Uh, no, I think it was speculated that it was cleaned pretty well. The murder weapon was found in Miller's room, so that's as close to a smoking gun as you can get. There was a lot of other evidence of guilt, though, so pleading guilty was likely the best bet for the teenagers. Miller and Goodale turned on each other after being arrested, claiming that the other did it and they were only an accomplice and didn't actually participate in beating her. But back in April, Jeremy Goodale pleaded guilty to the murder and explained what exactly happened. On November 2nd of 2021, I met um, Willard Miller, at Chautauqua Park, I understood that he had the intent to kill Mrs. Graber. Um, Chayden had brought um, a bat, among other supplies, to go through with the murder. And after he had struck Nohima Graber, um, we then moved her off of the trail, um, where I then struck her, and she died as a result. Miller changed his story multiple times. Agent Ryan Kedley conducted the interview. Here's him testifying about it. How many versions of the story would you say that Kate and Spontree during the first year? 
Well, there was certainly multiple versions, um, but within some of the later versions that he provided, he had, would add details um, as I would uh, break down those versions. Um, for example, um, in addition to what he was doing specifically, how those were, how those um, actions were taken. Um, Mr. Miller originally denied having any knowledge about um, the death of Mrs. Graber, correct? That's correct. Um, and later on, he talked about uh, actually witnessing a part uh, or a portion of, of her demise, correct? Yes, he described a, I guess, an incident where a group of masked individuals numbered somewhere between six and eight uh, had pursued uh, Miss Graber in Chautauqua Park. Uh, Miller described hearing what he described as a thud and then looking down into Chautauqua Park and seeing this group of masked individuals carry some sort of object into the woods, which he had assumed was Miss Graber herself. Agent Kedley also went on to say that Willard Miller during the interview was, quote, remarkably relaxed. After the state presented its witnesses and evidence, Judge Showers then asked Miller if he would like to address the court. Miller then spoke to the court and Graber's family. I would like to take this opportunity to wholeheartedly accept responsibility for the role that I've played in the murder of Newman Graber. I would like to apologize for my actions, first and foremost, to the family. I'm sincerely sorry for the distress that I've caused you and the devastation I've caused your family. And from the bottom of my heart, I am sorry for your loss. I'm sorry to hear about Paul Graber. Um, I would also like to apologize to the community, to, to just the ripple effect that, I, that my actions have had, the, everyone that has affected. I would like to apologize to Noah McGregor's church. Um, I know that she was very, I know now that she was a very active member there and, and doing a lot of good things there. Uh, I'd like to apologize for, for what I did and how that affected them. I would like to apologize to my family I love you guys so much, and uh, I'm, I'm really sorry for what I've done. I'm expecting you, and I'm planning on getting back out there as soon as I can to make up for the last time. I'd also like to apologize to the Goodale family. I, I'm sorry for the position that Jeremy's in, and I wish you the best, and I hope that he gets out as soon as possible. Sorry. I know what I did was wrong, and I accept responsibility for my carelessness, for my ignorance, um, and also I'd like to apologize to the police department and the investigators there for the misinformation I provided back in 2021. After Miller apologized, it was time for the victim impact statements. Noema's brother-in-law, Tom Graber, spoke about how Noema met with Willard Miller and his mother about improving his Spanish grade before the murder. Willard Jaden Miller and his mother met with Noema at the high school. And there, Miller promised Noema's, er, sought Noema's help in accomplishing his desire to study abroad in a Spanish speaking country, as his older sister had. Noema agreed to provide further help, help he'd previously spurned. And Miller promised to exert extra effort and really try harder in his class. His mother described the meeting as beautiful full of sweetness, positivity, and promise. All the while, Willard Shaden Miller knew his promise was false, knew he didn't intend to try harder. Instead, he intended to murder Noema that very afternoon, and that is exactly what he did. While his Confederate distracted Noema from the front, Willard Shaden Miller cowardly snuck up behind Noema and crushed her skull with a metal baseball bat. Noema's sister-in-law, Deanne Graber's statement, was then read by the victim witness coordinator, Sarah Harms. Deanne's statement touched on who Noema was and how she was taken from the world far too soon. I loved her rock-solid faith and so admired the strength and peace it provided for her in the difficulties of life. She was a mighty prayer warrior and well, as always, looking on the bright side of every situation. She made everyone feel like you were part of her family. 
and she had an encouraging, positive word, no matter what was going on. I'm sure she was the same incredible pillar of light in all areas of life, be it family, church, work, or community. The loss we have all suffered has been a major significance because of this horrific, evil crime that snuffed out a cherished daughter of the Most High God. I pray her soul fled straight to heaven the very moment her precious head was struck. I had never personally known anyone to be murdered in my 60 years of life, and I will never be able to understand or wrap my head around murder being a legitimate option for bad grades, or how you could ever talk a peer into doing something so heinous to your teacher. Finally, Noema's son, Christian Graber, delivered his victim impact statement. He spoke directly to Willard Miller. I want to talk to you directly, Shaden. I've got no hate in my heart for you. And I've met your mother on several occasions and we had good conversations. She seems like a decent woman. And I'll always treat her with kindness and respect. And I met your grandmother yesterday uh, before the funeral of my father. And we had decent conversations. And I feel sorry for you. And I really feel sorry for your mother, your grandmother, and all your family. They seem like decent people. And I still think that there's potential for you to become a decent person as well. In the end, Judge Showers gave Willard Miller a life sentence with the possibility of parole after serving 35 years. Joining me to discuss uh, this incredibly disturbing case is Chauncey Molding. He is one of the prosecutors who is working to put these teens in prison uh, for life for the murder of Noema Graber. Thanks so much for joining us, Chauncey. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Your thoughts on the sentence? I know you all were asking, I think, for 30 years um, parole eligibility. The judge gave 35. Uh, your thoughts on the sentence? Consideration for the defendant um, at a, taking a last minute plea and saving us from having to uproot the case and, and take all of our witnesses out to the other side of the state to prosecute the, uh, the matter. Um, I had not uh, resisted the defendant's motion to change venue in this case. Um, this is a, a smaller community, about 18,000 residents in the county. And with the victim's position as a teacher, uh, she's either been a you know, first or second level connection to essentially everybody in, in the town. Um, so it would have been extremely difficult to seat a, a fair and, and unbiased jury that had no uh, knowledge or, or understanding of the parties involved here. So. We were going to move this uh, all the way out to Council Bluffs, but uh, three or four days ahead of time, uh, Defense Council contacted us and basically um, asked, what what can we get here? If my guy, you know, uh, admits his responsibility here, what's your recommendation? Um, we had gone back and forth substantially on how much uh, of, a, of a minimum would be survivable under the present uh, um, understanding of how the, the Iowa Supreme Court has views uh, juvenile homicide defendants. Um, if Mr. Uh, Miller, and I'm going to refrain from talking about the Goodale case details, they're all relatively the same, but Mr. Goodale hasn't been sentenced. But with reference to Mr. Miller, our understanding is that a 35-year sentence would have been appropriate, fair, and just, and survivable under the present Supreme Court considerations. Um, and considering his, you know, plea of guilty, we had agreed to recommend a 30-year minimum. Um, however, I mean, the judge saw the exact same facts as, as we did, and uh, also apparently viewed 35 years as an appropriate, fair, and just sentence. Um, I'm, uh, I feel like justice was done, uh, and the right number was, was reached, and Mr. Miller will be eligible for parole at age uh, 58, I believe. Not a guarantee for him, but it's certainly um, appropriate. To go before the parole board and plead his case for release, it doesn't mean he will be released. Right. And, you know, nobody knows what the makeup of the parole board is going to be after 35 years. So it could go any number of ways. But um, Juveniles can't serve life sentences in the state of Iowa as as the law is presently interpreted. So uh, mm -hmm. this is a fair, a fair sentence. Was there any indication as to why he all of a sudden wanted to 
make a deal, as they say, because, uh, you know, I guess he could have blamed the co-defendant. I, I know you're not representing him. You were prosecuting him. But, um, you know, a last minute plea is always a possibility. Uh, that was obviously something you were open to. But it, was there any indication from the defense team as to why they were willing to 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 plead? I can't really speak for the defense team's uh, motives, but one of the, the themes that I noted throughout the entirety of this case from, from the Miller team is an absolute uh, urgency on trying to keep um, the grisly details of, of this case from public scrutiny. Um, and you can even see that in the sentencing hearing, they're making objections um, to the display of evidence of the actual crime scene, of the body, of the autopsy, and of the, of the reality of the, the crime that was committed. Um, a two-week trial um, in, it would have uh, certainly driven home the, the severity and the grisly details of this case uh, with more authority. Um, so one of their considerations, I imagine, was trying to kind of, well, Mr. Miller will have a life if he gets out after 35 years and having all of the um, full details available to the public might impact his future. So I think that could have been one of their considerations. Also, um, state's evidence was damning. Um, so any consideration they could get as far as sentencing goes uh, uh, would was another part of their considerations, I imagine. You know, juveniles are prosecuted all of the time for a number of crimes. Uh, well, many times we can't have a camera in there, so the public doesn't really get to see a lot of juveniles being prosecuted. But it, but it happens. Uh, juveniles are prosecuted for homicides, uh, sometimes as adults, sometimes not. Uh, have you prosecuted a lot of juveniles uh, for juvenile offenders for homicide? Not for first degree murder. Um, and. It, it needs to be underlined and, and restated. These two individuals were adults in all aspects of, of the law, except for sentencing in this case. Um, I, there was a, a contentious hearing trying to get them waived down to juvenile court, but in, under Iowa law, any um, forcible felony committed over age 16, first degree murder being the principal forcible felony, um, for all aspects of, of the law, these two individuals were adults. Um, but. Now, this, this type of crime doesn't happen very often here. The details are horrifying. I mean, a bad grade in a Spanish class, I think uh, every kid can relate to, or every parent who's been a kid or had children can relate to their child not wanting to get a bad grade. But this is taking it beyond the extreme. Uh, the details are gruesome. They are horrifying. What impact has this case had on the community there because you said it's a small community a lot of people probably knew noema uh, or had her as a teacher at one point in time i just can't even imagine and just the brutality of this crime um it yeah, obviously just devastated three families um and every every parent and particularly the teachers at the school um have been carrying this uh this weight on their shoulders since November 2nd of 2021. Fairfield Police Lieutenant uh, Kinsella testified at the sentencing that this has impacted the community and it'll probably never be the same, but hopefully with uh, this sentencing, we'll, we'll be able to start getting past it and um, move on. Willard Miller made a statement apologizing at the sentencing hearing. Your thoughts on what he had to say and did you believe he was genuine? I can't speak for you know, what was going on in his mind. I did not down one word when he was uh, allocuting, and that was uh, he apologized for his carelessness. And uh, that's not what happened here. They, they stalked her for weeks. They planned, he planned, uh, and prepared, and committed this, this grievous act. And, you know, carelessness is, it was a careful thing that they, that they did. I think it would have benefited Mr. Miller and everybody else involved for him to show a little bit more compassion and emotion in that in that uh, statement. But the statement is what it is. Noema Graber's family was, uh, I assume, on board with the plea deal because this spared them having to go through a trial. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we've been in close communication and close contact with the family. Um, one of the 
just very unfortunate aspects of the timing on this. Um, Noema's, uh, the, her husband expired. He, he passed five days before a sentencing um, and he was medically very unwell. He very much wanted to be there, um, but was not able to make it to the sentencing. Um, I, I don't know how easy it would have been for him to get to its five hour drive to, to where the trial was gonna be. Um, mm -hmm. It, sparing the family, uh, all of that was was certainly a part of our consideration, and and they um, were were on board with the, the resolution of this case. Jeremy Goodale uh, is scheduled to be sentenced in August. I know you said you don't want to talk about that because the case is technically still pending, but he has pleaded guilty. Uh, I've seen that his defense team is trying to delay that hearing. Um, any word on why that is? Um, it's my understanding they have an expert witness they have uh, scheduled to testify who is unavailable on the on the date. Um, we had resisted moving it based primarily on the health of Mr. Graber. Um, mm -hmm. As that is not a issue anymore, I suspect the judge is going to grant the continuance to some some future date uh, to allow for the defense to put on whatever witness they they want. But in general, uh, the state does resist. We just want to get this thing closed out, but I understand um, psychological uh, expert witnesses are in high demand, and and so uh, I suspect the judge will grant that continuance, but we'll we'll find out. Twenty five years to life is your, or I guess the life sentence with parole eligibility after twenty five years is what your recommendation is, or at least parole eligibility after twenty five years is. I know he was cooperating; he was likely going to testify against Willard Miller. Uh, still, though, I mean, this is a heinous, heinous crime, and it was on social media. It was documented uh, what they did. I mean, they bragged about this. So uh, 25-year parole eligibility, you obviously believe that's fair given his cooperation. His cooperation was a factor. Uh, there were a number of factors that went into the state's consideration of Mr. Goodale um, receiving a lower uh, recommendation from the state than Mr. Miller. Um, at the end of the day, Mr. Miller was a student of Mrs. Graber. He was the one failing the class. He was the one that recruited Mr. Goodale. Uh, he was the one that brought the the weapons. And uh, the state's evidence is that Mr. Miller was the one that struck her first. Um, but for Jaden Miller, Mrs. Graber would still be alive. I don't think you can say that about Jeremy Goodale. Well, Chauncey Molding, a Jefferson County attorney, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's a horrible case, and we appreciate your time. Thank you, Ms. Levy. Pleasure. That's it for this edition of Law & Crime Sidebar Podcast. You can listen to and download Sidebar on Apple, Spotify, Google, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, you can always watch it on Law & Crime's YouTube channel. I'm Anjanette Levy, and we will see you next time.